I think this is the eleventh meeting of the mind that we're meeting of the minds that we're having right now. Um, this is the first time we've reached to Australia to have this meeting, and I'm very pleased the person to whom we've reached. Uh, is someone that I met, I think it was at an ADI conference. And we were instantly realized that we were kindred spirits and that we were just, she was about a year and a half behind me in terms of being an advocate for this. And now she's about two years ahead of me because she's being very successful in Australia, at least right now. Um, um, geez, no, I can't remember her name. I was going to write it down on a card. I'm just terrible with names. Kate. Yeah. Kate is, um, a mother, an advocate, a wife, and a really nice person. She's going through the stages that I went through when I started out being an advocate and that I started out thinking I would change the world and all you had to do is just tell people what the message was and they'd say, oh yeah, that makes sense. And now we'll become advocates too. And when I realized that the world was willing to listen to me as they listened to Kate, but not do much about it, then I said, well, I'll do something here in the United States. And she said, I'll do something in Australia. And I started the first uh, uh, people with Alzheimer's and dementia uh, advisory group for my national association. And Kate was recently appointed to be the chairwoman of the uh, recently appointed advisory committee for Alzheimer's Australia. I must sadly say that Alzheimer's Australia is far beyond where we are in terms of their sensitivity and recognition of people with dementia. But I suspect in Kate's heart, they are far behind where they should be. And probably everybody that's listening to that meeting today believes the same. Um, we are the pioneers in this movement. And I suppose when you're a pioneer and you're trying to cross a country as big as Australia or the United States, it seems as if you've gone a long way and you've got a lot more to go. And why aren't people hearing your voice? Kate is a voice that I think is worth listening to. Kate has a fire in her stomach and her heart and her mind that I think is refreshing to be around. And so I'm going to ask my uh, partner and my technical assistant for this meeting to bring her up onto the screen. But first, I think she has something she wants to say, too. Is that right, Laura? Oh, yes. Um, welcome, everybody. And um, I, I just wanted to mention before um, Kate starts that we have some upcoming events and that you can see a calendar of events at the minds-meeting.com website. And if you're attending today, you will receive an email uh, probably towards the end of the week with a, a link to that website. And on there, you'll see the calendar of events. Next week is our Cafe La Brain um, uh, online memory cafe. And then in Dece on December 10th, we have Judy Berry, um, who is uh, the, I'm not entirely sure exactly what her title is now, but she is the director of the um, um, Lakeview Ranch in um, Minnesota, Darwin, Minnesota. And she's really on the cutting edge of, um, um, what would you say, methodologies for care, for dementia care that do not involve the use of um, drugs, chemical restraints. Um, I know this starts with, Sounds like kind of a harsh topic to be bringing here, but I think her, her message is something that we can all take away from. And I think that she provides a message of hope to everybody who um, may be diagnosed with a disease that things are changing and that the future does hold some brightness and she is amongst one of the brightest. So I hope that you can join us. That's on December 10th. Um, 
And you know what, Richard, I think we'll I think we'll jump right in after your wonderful segue to Kate. I don't want to lose that momentum. And then we'll come back to some other things afterwards to whomever's here. Okay. Um, Kate, I'm just going to put you in the spotlight now. Let's see how this works. Spotlight video. And that, I need to put the slides up eventually, Laura, so. Okay. Do so, that now. Sure, yes, because you can talk over the slides, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll just go off for a second to put them up. Okay. Um, while Kate is doing that, I want to thank everybody who sent in um, some donations over the past couple of weeks. Um, I'm really appreciative, appreciative of it, uh, both Richard and I. I have to um, book some more website hosting on Friday, and that's going to cost money. So it was very handy to have. So I really appreciate um, everything that you're doing. Thank you. Great, Kate. That looks awesome. So it looks like we're up. Is that right? We are. Fantastic. Yay. Um, well, so shall I get underway, Laura? Absolutely. Please do. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Um, well, thank you so much, number one, for inviting me to speak, Laura and Richard, and thank you for that very generous um, introduction, Richard. Um, some days I lose the fire in my belly, as you called it, and all I have to do is uh, look up one of your talks or read out of your book or link in with one of the other advocates from around the world. So. Um, it is very easy to have lots of ideals and dreams and feel very disillusioned because change is not as quick as we would like it. But just a little bit about myself. I, I was diagnosed uh, with dementia, probably uh, semantic, when I was 49, very early in the disease. So um, I've been able to work hard at perhaps slowing the progression of the symptoms. Um, I started advocating probably, I don't know, four years ago, three or four years ago, um, and presenting at conferences and events around the world. And one of the things that I really noticed is, uh, was that although the slogan, nothing about us without us, was always used, there seemed rarely to be people with dementia as plenary speakers at conferences about people with dementia. So that was one of my key driving forces to become an advocate, um, to give people with dementia true equality and inclusion in society. Um, so uh, today I'm presenting about the Alzheimer's Australia Dementia Advisory Committee. Oh, um, technical support here, Laura. Next slide. You know what I need to do? I was hoping the keyboard might do it for me. Can you swipe? Oh, I'm just using, I'm just doing it manually. So there you go. That. That's it. Perfect. It worked. Okay. So, so the Alzheimer's Australia Dementia Advisory Committee was recently established by Alzheimer's Australia. This inspirational group is the third of its kind in the world and the first in Australia. And the vision behind the committee was to give a fully inclusive voice to people living with a diagnosis of dementia in Australia. The broad of the committee is to build on the consumer focus within Alzheimer's Australia and its state and territory member organisations, specifically driven by people with dementia. So Alzheimer's Australia is committed to consumer involvement across all aspects of the organisation, including policy, advocacy and research. The creation of this group, the Dementia Advisory Committee, will help to strengthen the consumer involvement and advocacy at all levels of the organisation. So prior to this uh, committee, there were four existing consumer committees which you can see on the screen, each with their own focus. So focusing on national policy, national research, people with dementia from culturally and linguistically diverse communities, 
and people with dementia from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And we now have a group of people with dementia. These committees were made up of a com combination of people with dementia, family carers and health professionals, although the balance has been that there have always been many more carers than we have had previously because we've previously had more difficulty finding people with dementia. Our Fight Dementia campaign in Australia has significantly increased, increased awareness about dementia in the community and it has gone some way to help reducing stigma. And it's through this campaign that we've been able to find more people with dementia wanting to participate. The Dementia Advisory Committee is the first consumer committee in Australia comprised entirely of people with dementia. So just going through the aims of the committee, the, the aims are to work with Alzheimer's Australia to determine the priorities of people with dementia, to contribute to policy and advocacy work, to promote dialogue between those with dementia and service pro providers with a view to promoting a better understanding of our social and care needs, and to assist in the refining and evaluating of Alzheimer's Australia national programs to ensure that they truly represent people with dementia. It is a wonderful opportunity to become actively involved in shaping dementia services and policies. The very things that affect the futures and daily quality of life for people like us, people with dementia. So in our view, as it is globally, there should be no decision without us, about us, without us. And we hope to positively impact and change the lives of people living with dementia and their families across Australia. So here's a lovely picture of who we are. We have 12 members from across Australia. Um, as you can see on the slide, ages from 44 to 73. I was interim chair for the first meeting and was subsequently elected by my peers as chair for the next 12 months. And a member from Queensland, Mr. Eric Garnett, was elected as vice chair. As a group, our expertise is not restricted to the lived experience of dementia. We have people from, with a plethora of backgrounds, including a former registered nurse, a principal of an elite school, two people with PhDs, an accountant, and a number of other people with a vast experience, way beyond a diagnosis of dementia. Members come from around Australia, from both metropolitan and regional areas, to ensure there is a cross-section of views. We intend to broaden membership to include representation from our Indigenous, our called and our LGBTI communities. So how do we get to this point? The first group in the world like this, as most of you know, is the Scottish Dementia Working Group, founded in 2002. The outcomes for people with dementia have been significant, ensuring the contribution by those that policy and service provision effects is made, and that from then on in Scotland, there would be nothing about us without us. In 2012, a group of people with dementia from all over Europe met with this group to work on setting up a similar organisation and members of the newly established European Dementia Group presented at the European Alzheimer's Conference in Malta recently. Alzheimer's Europe reported they know from the experience of these groups run by people with dementia, for people with dementia, that the contact with others with dementia gives people greater confidence in speaking out in public roles and in raising awareness. This is really important as we endeavour to increase the number of people who want to become advocates in Australia and globally as the need to pass the baton for leadership and for speaking roles is really important. I met many of those people from Scotland along with meeting Richard who I'd met online um, 
at the Alzheimer's Disease International Conference in London in April 2012 and was really inspired by this group and by the group of people with dementia generally that met there to set this group up in Australia. So how did we get to this point in Australia? Initially, I pitched the idea to Alzheimer's Australia staff I was invited to discuss it at a meeting of an existing consumer advisory group in late or mid-2012. The idea was discussed robustly, but initially voted against as too difficult, not only in terms of the size of the continent we live in, but the perception of the ability of people with dementia being willing or able to, to participate fully. It was Interesting to note that Antonia Croy from Alzheimer's Austria highlighted that sometimes overprotectiveness by carers could become a barrier and that it was necessary to help carers to understand the advantages of specific groups just for people with dementia. So in Australia, the idea was revisited again when the opportunity arose to bring together a number of people with dementia from all over Australia at the Alzheimer's Australia National Conference in May 2013. At this meeting, which I also chaired, people with dementia discussed the merits of such a group and what the role of the group could entail. Upon taking the ideas and support of this group of people with dementia to Alzheimer's Australia, it was agreed that it would be beneficial to set up a new consumer committee. And thus the Alzheimer's Australia Dementia Advisory Committee was born. The idea for the committee was also supported by key stakeholders in the sector who could see the benefits of being able to consult such a committee on their work. We are really fortunate in this country to have leadership and commitment from the CEO of Alzheimer's Australia, Mr Glenn Rees. He's worked tirelessly to ensure resourcing for this group and attended our first two-day face-to-face meeting. Without the very great vision and goodwill of Mr. Rees and the staff, it could not have happened. So of course, most importantly, nothing could have happened if it was not for the support and commitment of others with dementia to take this idea forward with me. So behind my persistence to set up this group was the goal to give a voice to those of us living in Australia with a diagnosis of dementia, of any race, of any age, and to re-empower everyone with dementia who wanted to, to speak up. The next layer in the context of why a group like this was needed is that Alzheimer's Australia is a consumer organisation. It strives to give a voice to people with dementia and their carers, but recognised a gap in providing people with dementia a chance to have their say, particularly without the involvement of carers. People with dementia will now get a chance to more fully impact their own futures, to review and discuss policy as it affects them, and to bring about much needed change. That's the goal. As a consumer with dementia, it has been clear to me the voices of people with dementia have not been properly heard globally and I'm excited about what we might be able to achieve with this new group in Australia. Sorry about the technical challenges I'm having. So the inaugural meeting of the Dementia Advisory Committee was held in Canberra, our uh, capital city, during Dementia Awareness Week on the 17th and 18th of September 2013. It was agreed it was important that the first meeting of the group be face to face to allow members to meet and properly establish the role of this new committee. Meeting face to face also allowed the members to elect a chair, invite guest speakers, have the media present and meet the staff from Alzheimer's Australia who were supporting us. A sense of ownership and purpose from members would not have been possible if the first meeting had been done via teleconference or webinar only, we believed. The meeting spanned for two and a half, two days and half of the first day was spent getting to know members, understanding what each member hoped the committee go on to achieve 
setting meter, me, meeting protocols and finalising in terms of reference. These were, were all very important steps to guide the future direction of the committee. Prior to the meeting, members had been consulted on agenda items proposed by Alzheimer's Australia and suggested agenda items of their own. So topics discussed and workshopped over the two days included dementia-friendly communities. And with that, what that actually meant to people with dementia, what can be learnt from dementia-friendly communities overseas and how this committee will be involved in the work of creating dementia-friendly communities and organisations in Australia. We looked at improving dementia care in hospitals by providing feedback to a current government project aimed at improving care. Uh, one of our new members um, presented a paper on the challenges for people with dementia living alone. And we all agreed it was a very important issue to be pursued. We had project staff from the University of Wollongong who attended the meeting to seek feedback on their younger onset dementia project. Feedback was also provided to Alzheimer's Australia on their new younger onset dementia key worker program. The committee was also filmed by a, a commercial television station, a current affair, during a follow up workshop on dementia friendly communities, which we hope gave more exposure to the group and helped to get more people interested in joining and in what we're doing. We ended these empowering and liberating two days with a session on our priorities and future work and self-evaluation. Just some quotes. Um, Steve, the youngest member of the committee, said very eloquently, it is my right to speak for myself, no matter how much time it takes or how much of a struggle it is. Of course, he is right. And the journey for people with dementia is now one of not just accepting the diagnosis, not just accepting the fact that it's a terminal illness and so on, but to think of our symptoms as disabilities, one, ones that we can and must learn to manage and live with. By re-empowering people with dementia to speak up for themselves, this group hopes to make it possible for people whose voices have previously seldom been heard, heard to contribute to shaping the matters that affect them. So hopefully no longer will we be told by people without dementia how we feel or what is best for us. And whilst we still have a voice of our own, we will be able to advocate for ourselves. Self-determination is a key priority to our vision. So a few more comments about the meeting. It will, I am sure, play a significant role in mobilising our voice as people with dementia. One of the carers on the first evening said to me jokingly, I thought this new group would be a waste of time and money, but I'm thrilled to see that people with dementia are still so capable of speaking up and how productive it has been. And a person with dementia. I too thought the inaugural committee meeting was really worthwhile and it was so good to talk to other people in our situation, both those with dementia and those who stand by us, and how we will now hopefully take a real part in the decision making that affects us. On the very, at the very end, someone wrote, it was an emotional and moving couple of days, one of the Alzheimer's Australia staff. So just a little bit about the structure of the group. It's a freestanding committee that exists alongside the four other existing consumer groups within Alzheimer's Australia. The committee will provide advice directly to the CEO, as well as the policy, research and program managers as required. Members will determine the direction, the aims and the priorities of the committee. There are currently 12 members of the group and the aim is to have 12 active members of the committee at any one point in time. It is, there is also funding to support our carers to attend face-to-face -face meetings with us. 
To help facilitate this and to assure the longevity of the group, the committee aims to establish a much broader network of members. Members would not necessarily be expected to, to participate in the meetings, but we aim to keep them up to date with the work of the group and ask for feedback on projects or other work when possible. In that way, as we build a broader network of people with dementia, there will be somebody else to pass the baton on to. At this stage, it is planned there will be one or two face-to-face -face meetings per year with monthly teleconference or webinars in between. Members will also communicate and provide feedback via email. The next few meetings of the committee will see boundaries form between what is helpful and what is hindering our abilities to function for ourselves. A learning curve for all the couples living with Mr Dementia and their family. The members of the group, as I said, can be supported by partners or carers for travel. Throughout the two-day meeting, there was a subtle but noticeable changing of the guard. As people with dementia became re-empowered to speak up, and the carers realised that they could sit back and let us. During a session of self-reflection and self-evaluation after the meeting, we realised a number of strategies will be needed to continue. Simple things like presenters using a microphone, having printed notes for pre-reading and handouts so that we have visual aids and don't just have to rely on our sometimes inefficient auditory abilities. None of these strategies are unachievable or unreasonable, as we are simply a group of people living with a variety of disabilities, wanting to contribute to our own futures. So the support from Alzheimer's Australia is significant. Mr Rees found funding to cover the Secretariat administrative support provided by the Alzheimer's Australia staff, as well as meeting the costs and travel for both the person with dementia and their carer when required. Alzheimer's Australia will provide ongoing secretariat and, and administration support, including facilitating the process for members to provide feedback and comment on ongoing work, organisation of meetings, teleconferences, webinars, face-to-face -face meetings, sourcing speakers for meetings and setting up and supporting consultative opportunities for the group. They prepare the agenda pa papers, they take the minutes, they manage the booking of our travel and accommodation and they're promoting, actively promoting the group and the media. Most importantly, providing the appropriate assist assistance for us to manage our varying disabilities, as any organisation would for any disabled employee or volunteer. So where to next? Based on the first face-to-face -face meeting and the first teleconference, which was held only yesterday, the group now has a priority list and work is being undertaken in a number of areas. In addition to ongoing work, new members are still being sought actively from around Australia to create this broader network that I spoke of earlier. And we continue to seek individuals with dementia of all ages to join us. It's really, really important, I believe, that we build up this database to continue this important work, as no longer is it acceptable for policymakers, organisations and service providers to make decisions for us and about us without us. So that phrase has been around for as long as I've been advocating and it's been around for much longer than that, which just shows that it can be a slow road to achieve consumer empowerment. As far as I know, it was first used in 1998 at a global seminar, which was held in Salzburg to develop ideas for improving the quality of healthcare by involving patients. The Scottish Dementia Working Group have been using it since 2002. Uh, DASNI, I believe, started using it. Um, 
I think since 2000, a number of the organisations, even in the state that I live in, particularly in the disability sector, use that same slogan. So it's been around uh, for a long time and hopefully the concept is finally becoming a reality for people with dementia in Australia. So thank you. I'm not sure whether I was speaking for long enough, but are there any questions? Thank you, thank you Kate. Um, okay, so questions. Yes, I am sure everybody has lots of questions. What we do here is um, there's a chat box uh, which you can access usually at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it looks like a little voice bubble and if you click on that, that brings up the chat box and some people have already been using it. You can type in your questions there and um, I think that we're a small enough group today. We're, we're a good size. Um, that if you would prefer to speak your question rather than um, rather than type it in um, because that's easier for you, just um, just I don't know. Well, type a couple of words into the chat box like I'd like to say something, and then um, I'll unmute you, and uh, you can you can take your turn. We'll just have to take turns. That's all. Um, so let me just, uh, so right now I just wanted to let you know that you all are muted and um, Richard, if you want to, to speak, um, hang on, I'll just unmute you now. Um, okay, now, now everybody's good. Um, yeah, I had you all muted because sometimes we get a lot this of This is something noise. that every National Alzheimer's Association should Yeah. Um, so Phil has a question right off the bat. Um, does Dementia Advisory Committee take written minutes, conclusions and or recommendations and is there a facilitator? Uh, yes, there is, Laura. Um, Outside of Australia are providing the staff at the meetings. So they, they handle all of the paperwork, they type up the agenda, they type up the minutes, they um, manage all of this. so if if some information is sent for us to review we all send our various comments into uh, our secretariat and she manages all of uh, all of that activity um, could you exp oh, oh, um John Sandbloom has a question I, I just wanted to ask something before that you keep using the word consumer when I think consumer, I think what we have here is a consumer report. It's for buying cars, you know, things like that. So, how does this work in the in the context? It, in Australia, it seems that consumer is the word that they've given to people with dementia. So, in in the healthcare system and organisations, the family carer is just commonly known as the carer, and the person with dementia is known as the consumer. So that, that's our sort of title. There, there is currently some talk about uh, trying to find a new term for people with dementia. Um, a lot of people are saying they don't like the word consumer. Some organisations, some of the service providers are now calling us care recipients. So I'm not sure I like that either, but you know, I'd really much rather just be called Kate. Right. <laughs> so it's because you're the consumer of the services that they provide. Of the services, yes. So. Okay. Right. okay. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm just reading out the questions that people have typed into the chat box. I'm monitoring that. So, um, okay, somebody is, I'm going to mute everybody here, I think. Okay. Um, so John asks, um, how is Alzheimer's Australia structured? Is it the equivalent of a non-profit? Um, I just lost it here. Is it the equivalent of a non-profit in the US or is it more of a government agency? I think I'm pretty sure it's the equivalent of a non-profit, but I can't answer that 100%. Um, but I know that they're constantly vying for grants and funding. so. Uh, in in a way, they're similar to any other service provider organisation in Australia. Um, 
So uh, Steve says, um, this is great, Kate. We need to start something like this in the States. I know the Alzheimer's Association has, they do have a national committee. Are, are you familiar with it, Kate, with the concept of the National Alzheimer's Association? I don't even know what the committee is called, but there is a committee. But they don't seem to, I, I can't see the media actively promoting it somehow. <laughs> I don't know that too many people even know it exists. So can you draw a parallel between the two, or do you, do you know enough about the committee to say what's different about your committee or how you're being treated? I don't, I don't know. I really don't know anything about the committee in the States, Laura. I apologise. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming you're saying it's a committee of people with dementia? It is. Richard, maybe and they're, are, yeah. are they funded by the Alzheimer's Society? Well, Steve, Steve just put his hand up, so he's going to speak to that. He's familiar, so is Richard. Yeah. They have an early stage advisory board that they have set up, that they have members. But what, they're, what they do is everything that they attempt to do is structured by the Alzheimer's Association. So if you're on the board and you have an idea, if it doesn't fit within the guidelines of the Alzheimer's Association, it doesn't move forward. That's why we need to, with Richard and everybody, John and everybody else that's here, I would love to set up some kind of advisory group here in the States where we can be the grassroots and what we need feel needs to be done. We can step forward and pursue that rather than having somebody hold my hand and say, well, you can't do that because, you know, it's against our policies and procedures. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, Steve. I think that maybe um, maybe it's different in Australia. Um, since Glenn Reese has been CEO, he is really, really committed to consumer involvement and uh, not just tokenistic involvement. So I am involved on two other consumer groups, the National um, Advisory uh National Consumers Advisory Committee, which is made up mostly of people without dementia, carers, but there's also two or three people with dementia on it. And uh, we've been looking at policy and helping uh, shape the future of Alzheimer's Australia and what it does uh, for its um, people with dementia and, with, and for the, our families. And then there's a research group that uh, a group of consumers are on, on a research committee to help um, the future of research, dementia research in Australia. Um, so I think that from the Australian perspective, they really are working very hard to listen to our voice and to help shape the policies around what we want rather than say, no, that's not suitable um, and ignore it. it, it I, I do feel a little bit lucky in Australia that that they are willing to listen to us, not just listen, but actually take notice of what we say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Kate, could you um, stop your screen sharing so that when you're talking, you're live on the screen? It, um, oh, it's so easier, if I easier take, off, to watch. take off the slide, will I? Yeah, yeah, there's just a button that says stop screen share. I don't know if it's on the iPad. Oh, okay. Uh, and I don't think I can do it for you stop uh, stop uh, don't, don't stop the in the meeting Just, uh, <laughs> if you can't find it that's okay oh there you go oh, that's oh, a, oh, look at that. Is that right yeah. yeah there you go Good. I don't know how I did that right <laughs> You did it, and everybody's still here, so we're good. <laughs> oh, good. I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> so, the Alzheimer's Australia has been key. I I am astounded by their support. Do you think this could have happened without them? Is well, do you know? When I came back from London, Laura, I, I was so fired up to set up a group like the Scottish Dementia Working Group. And uh, the response, initial response from Alzheimer's Australia was, yes, we really like to talk about that. Um, 
present the idea to uh, one of the national consumer groups and the response from the consumer group was so negative. I, I really went home, not with my tail between my legs, but astounded in a way that um, people weren't excited by this idea. And uh, I do think that some of the voice of people with dementia was a bit more tokenistic not so much that Alzheimer's Australia weren't listening, just that there weren't enough of us. And the stigma, even I see all around the world and even in with service providers, often there's a really subtle stigma still against people with dementia contributing. You know, why aren't people with dementia on the boards of their organisations all around the world? To me, that's a no-brainer. You wouldn't have uh, organisations looking after our gay communities or our disability communities without involving those people. There wouldn't be heterosexuals telling the gay community what to do. There aren't able-bodied people telling disabled people what to do. And to me, it's just exactly the same for people with dementia. So I decided just to keep kind of chipping away, you know, my husband probably would call it nagging behind the scenes to say, hey, why can't we have a, a group for people with dementia? And, you know, I, I, I looked at whether I could set it up on my own, but the funding needed to do it is, is astronomical. I, I don't have the funds to do that. And individuals with dementia and their families certainly don't have the funds to pay their own way because most of us have all given up work. Not only the person with dementia, but our carers have given up paid employment. So we're all in a, a very financially marginalised position compared to the working professional community. So for Glenn Reese, the CEO, and his team to have the vision to just keep chipping away at the idea behind the scenes, but then to find the funding to support this I think is really significant and then to want to give us a voice to actively work to get this out in the media I think is a really huge positive for Australia but also for people with dementia globally because it is an example that's been set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that answer? Yep. Right. I have a ton of questions, but I don't want to monopolize this. So please put your put your questions down in the chat box um, or flag me down in the chat box if you'd like to speak. Um, I can I can't see everybody on the screen at once. So if uh, if you wave, um, I'll try and catch you. Um, so I'll say one more question, but you guys, please, please think of your questions. Um, I think that for some of us, uh, I'm speaking from Canada, perhaps the idea of having a national advisory committee or even a provincial advisory committee is so esoteric, so far out there that it's yeah. hard to, to wrap our minds around how this could happen or, or why it would happen. I, I certainly hope it does. I'm frustrated. What did you see in the Scottish Working Group that inspired you? And how do you think that is working? How do you think... Um, well, what I saw in London, um, Laura, and, and I guess in London I had a couple of things happen that really fired me up. You know, I've been following Richard for some time before I um, started advocating and to meet Richard was a lifetime dream come true. Thank you, Richard, for being there and for being my hero. Um, and every time I felt like up I just think Richard Taylor so thank you for that to, to meet Richard and to meet that group of people from all around the world like Helga from Munich uh, and others whose names I can't remember um, but we in the you know the room for people with dementia where we could go and have some quiet time the people from Scotland because there was a large group of them there they hung out there quite a lot and we got to know them really well and went to their 10th and I was going to say wedding anniversary their 10th the 10th anniversary of their group and I just came away so inspired by 
the notion that a group of people with dementia were happy boys, were actually helping to shape policy um, and that they had a broader network and there were no egos in the way. So, you know, if one week the person who was the designated chair didn't feel well enough to run the meeting, somebody else was there to, to pick up the baton and continue on. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just dependent on a small group of people um, uh, advocating on behalf of everybody else. You know, they really have built up a wider network it seemed to me of people with dementia, so that so that they can all support each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, question from MB, who says, "Great, great, great, Kate. You mentioned this is one of three committees. What are the other two? Um, the other committees um, are, I had them up on the screen, but uh, one is the National Consumers Advisory Committee." Um, and I might just refer to my notes so I don't get it wrong. Even though I'm on both committees, I need to double check I get this right. Hmm. So the National Consumers Advisory Committee, in a way, it's looking at the same things that we are, but it's a um, not a dementia people with dementia specific um, voice. So it's a, made up of a group of carers from around Australia, and I think there's three of us with dementia on that committee as well. And we look at policy and and uh, review projects in. Uh, you know, dementia-friendly projects. So looking at quite similar work to what the new Dementia Advisory Committee is now looking at, but the new group has a very specific people with dementia voice. Um, and then the other one is the Consumer Dementia Research Network, and that uh, network's been going for, I think, three years, and we... Uh, look at new research pro proposals, for example, and um, we might, uh, you know, make a suggestion to a researcher that they modify their proposal to uh, to look at whatever they were planning to look at a different way. Uh, you know, we even uh, sometimes reject funding for research proposals. Okay. So it's a bit more of a clinical look at dementia as opposed to a consumer's voice. Hmm. That's that's interesting, though. That you so you're having input on funding priorities. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's great. Um, John says. Uh, it is one of the best thoughts I have heard in a while to compare to other things that wouldn't dare to dare to have committees or organizations saying what to do with certain people without involving those people at every turn. So what you were saying, for example, I, I love your parallel to the to the uh, the gay community that um, if they had heterosexuals organizing their rallies and conferences and <laughs> fun in priorities, that would be crazy. So so John goes on to say, why does the U.S. do that with dementia, stigma or just ignorance? Are they scared of us? It is bizarre, actually. Um, so, Kate, what are, <laughs> what are what do you think it is? <laughs> well, I, you know, I think it's a whole range of things, Laura. Um, I think that there is still quite a bit of uh, really subtle stigma and uh, myths within the organisations that um, support us and advocate for us. Um, you know, I in dementia as a nurse, dementia care as a nurse, and I think that my uh, feeling about people with dementia before I was diagnosed was end stage. And so if, 
in our subconscious, our feeling about a person with dementia is that they're at the end stage. Well, you know, and at end stage in dementia, it, it's a lot more difficult to contribute, as you know. Um, if there's that undercurrent in society that, that people with dementia, you know, I often say, you know, people think I should be sitting in a corner dribbling or taking my clothes off in the lift. Um, if there's that subconscious feeling that that's really where people with dementia are, um, it's very hard to accept that we can be out there in full contributing roles like speaking at conferences. But, you know, at conferences, if there's a three-day Alzheimer's Disease International Conference, in my opinion, there should be a keynote speaker, person with dementia, funded by ADI or Alzheimer's Australia or whoever is running that conference, if it's the organisation that says they're advocating for us, then surely we should be included at that level. Of all the people who can't afford to attend conferences, people with dementia are the ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to have heterosexuals as keynote speakers at the homosexuals conference would be outrageous. Amen. You know, I say it so often it even bores me, but mm -hmm. I'm still saying it and I'll keep saying it until it changes. Mm -hmm. Let me say a few things that have come to my mind, Kate. Um, one thing I think you should look at is how you can get involved with the board of the Alzheimer's Association. They are really the power behind every Alzheimer's Association. Mm. The second thing is I would look to develop some sort of an outreach committee for, for goal to try to get um, uh, more um, media coverage of your meetings because uh, that's how you're going to get your power and that's how you're going to maintain your influence is yeah. by other people telling the Alzheimer's Association what a great idea this is yeah. and how amazed they were with this. Uh, it's one thing to, to convert them to us but they have full-time jobs already and they're already working all the time. Exactly. So they really don't have time to switch gears unless they're forced into it, pushed into it, encouraged by it. And mm -hmm. I think that was our mistake to stay within house and be satisfied with the impact we were making on the minds of the Alzheimer's Association because it didn't translate into the behaviors of the Alzheimer's Association. Yeah. I mean, I've tried twice to get on the board of the, my state Alzheimer's Association and uh, failed as an unsuitable candidate both times. So I didn't even nominate this year. I didn't think it was worth it. Um, I think that, you know, as far ahead as we are, we still have a long way to go as well. And, and that's, I think that's the experience globally. Um, and, you know, it, in a way it reminds me of um, the disease cancer 30 years ago when I first started nursing. People didn't visit anyone with cancer. They were scared they might catch it. They were put in wards at the back of the hospital. Um, and we've come a long, long way with other diseases and, uh, you know, just breaking down the myths and the stigma of dementia, we're still a long way from doing that. Um, and until we can do that, then, it, you know, it's not going to become an easy road yet. So I'm very cognizant of, of your comment recently, um, not for the group not to become just a group where we have bits of paper pushed at us that we comment on and no, no further action. And I, I have great faith that Alzheimer's Australia will go beyond that. Um, and, and I also encourage you to give, uh, or to reach a consensus on what every member is going to do to be proactive about this, rather than to sit back and watch you and cheer you on. You really want to have 12 more or 11 more Kates on the committee. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, already about half of the members of this group are out in their own communities presenting all the time. Um, one couple in Western Australia are, are presenting at least, I think almost every week, getting the word out about dementia and um, breaking down some of those myths and stigmas. So, um, but as you know, it's a long, slow road. But it's mm -hmm. delegating areas of responsibility to different members of the committee rather than let them sit back and watch you be the spokesperson or the ideas person for the committee. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that advice. I'll, uh, you know, keep reminding me. <laughs> um, Frida had a question. Frida's from the, uh, from, from the UK, and she was wondering, in Australia, do you meet in person or on the internet? And are you funded for expenses by the Alzheimer's Association or by other sources of funding? So no, we're funded. We're funded through Alzheimer's Australia National Office, um, and they we meet face to face um, once or twice a year, and that is in Canberra. And Alzheimer's Australia pay for our travel, our accommodation, uh, and all of our travelling costs, including food, uh, and they also fund. Um, transport of our partners with us so that if we wish to bring our care partner we can and then the other meetings so far we've only had one other meeting and that was by teleconference call we are looking at the possibility of webinar um, but not everybody has the ability to set up a webinar like Helga in Munich said that she can't join these webinars for some reason so not everybody has the same access to technology um, and the internet. So uh, some of our communication is really going back and forth between each other and head office by email because, you know, that gives us time then to think about how we want to respond um, or evaluate work and then we can send it back into head office. They then put all of our comments together, send us back another draft of a document, for example, that we can then all comment on again. So really, it's setting up a variety of ways to communicate because we don't all communicate well in the same way. Okay. Um, MB had a question about where, what strategies seem to be working to generate your member list? Uh, this is a great question, which I've heard from other people who would like to put together committees or to, just to find people with dementia to, to join um, various efforts, but how, what strategies are you using to reach people with dementia to join? Gee, that's a tough question, uh, Laura. Mm -hmm. um, I think that through the media, partly, mm -hmm. um, and media releases uh, throughout each state organisation. So in Australia, the National Alzheimer's Australia is separate to each state's Alzheimer's Australia, so Alzheimer's Australia, South Australia or Victoria is an independent body to Alzheimer's Australia National. So they did some of the marketing through each state office, so newsletters and emails and um, press releases, things like that. And beyond that, we're, we're trying to use the media a little bit. Um, and, you know, like in each state, uh, where there is a consumer alliance group, and I'm, I, I'm on the South Australian Alzheimer's Australia consumer alliance group. So that way I um, am able to network with more people with dementia. So it's really a very slow process and, and, and um, you know, the, I don't know how else to answer that. Uh, we're a long way from, from having a database that covers uh, a broader you know, broader percentage of, of the number of people here in Australia. So, you know, there's over 320,000 people in Australia with dementia and we managed to find really just over 12 people who wanted to join this group and I find that remarkable, uh, not in a good way. But, you know, it is a slow process. So, um, and I, I think partly 
when we are diagnosed with dementia, we are given what I call, I don't know what happens in the States or the UK or other countries, but what's happened to me and what happened to nearly everybody I've talked to with dementia, after our diagnosis, the prescription that we're given, especially uh, beyond the Aricept or the possible medication prescription, the other prescription everybody's given is prescribed disengagement from their pre-diagnosis life. And we've become so disempowered to continue to live well that I think that's part of the reason. Um, and, you know, I think by going more public, the more we re-empower people with dementia, to live pre-diagnosis lives. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's the only disease I know where you're not told to keep living. This one you're told to go home and give up. Any reactions from people out there who have received the same sort of diagnosis? Uh, well, I think everybody is told to, to go home, mm -hmm. give up work, give up life as you knew it, and live for the time you've got left, which to me is just completely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if well, you know, my neurophysio, for example, uh, has offered me rehabilitation in the same way that he would have if I was a brain injury patient, and we believe that that slowed the progression of the disease. It's not a cure, but it's definitely helped me live more. You know, helped with my well-being, and. If I had a stroke, I would have been rehabilitated and sent back to work. So I think younger people with dementia should have that opportunity to to be as real, rehabilitated as well as they can, learn to manage their disabilities and mm -hmm. continue on with their pre-diagnosis life if they want to, mm -hmm. instead of being told to give it all up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the problem we have in finding others to take up advocacy and speaking roles. I really do think there's no research to support it. Maybe I need to do that. But that's in my heart and in my, you know, anecdotal evidence experience. I think that's maybe what's behind it. Mm -hmm. People don't actually think they can have a voice. Kate, would it be appropriate to share the story about the caregiver reaction in the committee? Or you can just say no. <laughs> oh, I, over I the think first I, couple of days <laughs> you alluded to I, it but yeah yeah I, I think I put that on the screen Laura one of the uh, carers said to me that the evening the first evening we were there that and, and after our first day she really thought that this group was going to be a total waste of money and a waste of time and she was really really um, thrilled that by the end of the day she could see that people with dementia had all been re-empowered to find their voices, but also our loving carers had been really re-empowered to take a bit of their own life back and let us speak for ourselves. So, you know, nobody, like my husband wants to help me all the time, not because he wants to take over my life, it's because he loves me. So, it, you know, it is really very much a juggling act. Is how much does he let me struggle and how much does he help? Hmm. Hmm. One wonders if this was this epiphany or this self-interest, this, this new understanding or appreciation of us carried over into their relationship with their, their own spouse. Yeah, well, you know, I do wonder that, Richard. On uh, on the first day of the two-day meeting, almost all of the carers stayed in the room most of the time. And on the second day, most of them wandered off and did some lovely tourist things and had some time out together. You know, they went and saw the flower show or went walking or went to the art gallery. And uh, because they learnt that... Uh, their loved ones actually could speak for themselves. Um, and when they came back into the meeting, many of them were out for a lot of the second day and they came back for the final session. And uh, some of them got really cranky with 
their partner with dementia because the minute they walked in the room, the person with dementia um, suddenly stopped being able to talk for themselves. So it's just a relearning of roles, I think, Richard, and I, I hope that it flowed over into life beyond our meetings. Mm -hmm. But if you've been set up to disengage and your partner's been set up to take over, then, you know, you, it's easy to take on the, the kind of victim and the martyr role, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in Canada, we have, um, in many, many cities, um, we have something called the First Link Program. And what that is, is uh, that when somebody receives a diagnosis um, of dementia, that the doctor and the Alzheimer's Society have coordinated so that with the person's and the caregiver's permission, the, the doctor will then contact the Alzheimer's Society who will then contact the person and the family a few weeks after, after sort of the shock has passed. It's, it's a great idea. Um, it, the idea is that nobody falls through the cracks. Um, however, it wouldn't be, usually what they're told is um, about how to plan for the future and the prescribed disengagement. How great would it be if, as part of the First Link program, in addition to all the other information that they got, they, they were told, and here's this group, here's this committee, here are the people who speak with you, and Absolutely. you don't need to give everything up, and you know this, this is what you can join. I would love to see that. Um, Laura, can I add to that? Mm -hmm. I think that um, my experience with dementia, I think, has been quite unique because... Uh, you know, I was 49 years old. I was working full time. I had have two children. One was doing his final year at school. I don't know what that's called in the states, but year 12 here. Um, and I was also a student at a tertiary institution at university, studying a bachelor of psychology and a bachelor of arts. So my medical team suggested I give up work and study. And I continued to work until my licence was rescinded. And then at university, I obviously there are disabilities with uh, the symptoms of dementia. So I had I have some episodic memory loss, and and I've got a lot of dyslexia issues now that I didn't have before. And I was chatting, being a mature age student, you become friends with the lecturers. So I was chatting away with one of the psych lecturers saying how difficult studying had become and she's I, I, you know, like, do you think I need to give up? And she said, don't be so ridiculous. Go and see the disability advisor and talk to the counsellors and see if they can help find ways to support you to finish your degrees. So they just completely ignored the term dementia and they... You know, I had to go through a whole process of getting uh, letters from my doctor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to qualify as a disabled student. But then I tapped into the disabled student services and they just constantly helped me work with strategies to keep studying, but strategies to manage the symptoms of dementia as if they were just, you know, no different to losing my legs in an accident. Somebody would have helped me either work out how to use my wheelchair or how to work use prosthetics. It was exactly like that. So just very matter of fact, no emotion. So what? You've got dementia. You can. You don't have to die now. Um, so I think that I was in a really unbelievably lucky spot. If you can say, you know, you've got some good luck in your life, I think that was it. That was my lucky spot to be. Um, and so it taught me to see those symptoms differently. I didn't see them as things that were stealing the essence of who I am, even though some days it feels like that. They taught me to say, okay, how can I manage that? What strategy can I use to help continue to live well. So I, I don't know anybody else who's had that experience. Oh, no. 
Um, Dina asked to speak. Um, Dina, are you there? Yes, I am. I was didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to make note that I, at least in my experience, with the fluctuations in my symptoms in in the disease, it's hard for the people around me to to adjust themselves to that. And so that's one thing that I know that I'm dealing with is the the fluctuations in the disease and how people react. So that's one thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd have to agree with that, Dina. Um, Christine Bryden, who Richard Taylor and Laura know really well, and she's been advocating in Australia long before me. The second book that she wrote, she called that Dancing with Dementia because very much it is like, you know, going around a dance floor and sometimes you step on each other's toes and and other days it goes smoothly and it's very much like that. It's a really wonderful title for a book. I um, agree. It's a learning process and, and because our, our symptoms are changing all the time, it's a bit like being at sea. You don't know what's around the next wave. Well, I found even the medical community is really struggling with that. You know, they... they, they they don't under, They don't seem to be able to wrap their heads around the fact that it does fluctuate, even though they say in words, when they're actually dealing with you, it's it's different. I, I totally agree. So it it's wonderful to meet you, and thank you. <laughs> Likewise, thank you. Um, Richard, you alluded earlier to. Um, um, to the, I, I guess to summarize, the power of uh, being able to reach a lot of people, you said maybe by email or a mailing list, in the hands of people with dementia, and that people, that or organizations are afraid of that. Can you speak to that? I thought that was a very interesting comment. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Richard? Yes, ever oh. since I started speaking, but when, when I'm through speaking, I, I say to the audience, now I have a newsletter. It's actually not a newsletter. There's no news in it. It's just what I'm thinking. And if anyone would be interested in it, would you give me your, your uh, mailing address? And I've collected about 40,000 names just by asking people to give me their mailing address. So that's what my newsletter goes out to. Mm -hmm. There is power in that. I can see it. I can hear it in other people when they find out that I have a large mailing list. Yeah. Um, I think our problem is we spend too much time talking to each other. It feels good for us and not enough time talking to other people, not necessarily those mm -hmm. who we directly want to impact because I don't know why, but it just seems as if telling them how we feel and what we want and who we are is just not enough to change their minds. They need to be reinforced by other people, by the people that they listen to. They don't listen to us the way they used to listen to us. Yeah. So I think we need to reach out to the medical community, even if it's only just our own doctor. We need to reach out to some politician that we read that their mother has dementia or somebody else has dementia in their family and adopt them. Uh, that's how we're going to make a broader impact, I think. Trying to change the minds of people whose minds are already made up and who are in a, in a tight group of believers themselves, like they all work in the same office or they're yeah. all on the same fundraising team is a very difficult thing to change, I found, just practically speaking. So the best way is to just throw it out there and see who responds, mm. I believe. Yeah. Because otherwise we end up having conferences like this where even if we have 100 people, we all agree with what they're saying before we even turned in. It's, yeah, it, it raises our souls and makes us more excited. 
but then we just go out and find another 100 people. Well, that's fine to do, but we really want to find somebody who knows a 1,000 people mm -hmm. and will mm -hmm. tell their 1,000 friends about this. That's yeah. how we'll make an impact, I think. I, th I think blogging has done that for me, Richard. Yes, yes. So I've been writing every day, yeah. How many people read your blog? Oh, gosh, over 11,000 followers now. Yes, that's what I mean. Mm. Uh, and, and all sorts of different people, not just people with dementia, right. but service providers and writers and poets and, you know, people I've never heard of. It's amazing. Yes, so, and you wonder how the hell they all got connected with you. Yeah. They yeah. did through some second party or third party or fourth party. Yeah. yeah. And our challenge then is to get... Uh, you know, even a, a tenth of those 11,000 people to do something. Exactly. Rather than yeah. just read your blog and become another believer, but keep hiding their candle yeah. under a bushel. Yeah. And so we have to move to that level of awareness, I think. Mm. Because otherwise we're always singing to the choir. That, well, that's exactly right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what I meant by that, Laura. Yeah, D Dina, Dina's comment was that people aren't really interested until they are affected by the disease. Right. A few people agreed with that. Um, do, do you think so? What, what's the challenge in that area? People don't. People aren't interested until they're affected by the disease. And fundraisers have found that if they scare people and remind them that we're all going to die of it, or we're all sufferers, or we're all living terrible lives and, and sliding down a slide in terms of the quality of our lives, they can get them to donate money, but they can't get them to take one of us out to lunch to find out <laughs> if that's really true or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the people who really have their their thumb on the pulse of, of public opinion and on politi politicians, it's the wrong thumb. And while it's great they have a thumb out there, it's the wrong thumb in terms of our interests. Mm. Uh, you know, it it's very difficult, and I, I always think to myself, someone asked me this years ago, how do you eat an elephant? Yes. One mouthful at a time. Yeah. So if we all do one thing every day that, that can impact even the tiniest change, if whether it's an attitude or whether it's policy or whether it's even our own belief about ourselves, then that's, to me that's been a good day. But I'm not sure if we're not all chewing on the same toenails of an elephant. And that's when we try to change the hearts and minds of the Alzheimer's Association. Mm. They are so invested in what they do. That's why they do what they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're convinced that's the best thing to do. Mm. And ours just openly says, well, that's how we serve research is how we serve the needs of people with dementia. So stop mm. whining about it, Richard, and just be happy that we're spending, uh, you know, two-thirds of our budget on research. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Richard, I, I kind of respectfully disagree with something that you said a couple minutes ago, that we're all no. basically preaching, the t yeah, I do, to pre preaching to the converted. We're all sitting here talking, and we like talking to each other, but we're all talking to each other, and we're all in agreement. But you know what's different? Is that a year ago, we weren't talking to each other. Well, well now, and I were. Yes. And now we're talking to somebody in Australia, and somebody in England, and somebody in Hungary. Yeah. And I, 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 I do agree with you that I'm, I'm, I don't know that the larger organizations are all quite ready for people with the disease to be talking to each other because that could be a little scary. I, I agree <laughs> I with think, that. I think Australia, you have a visionary as a CEO, and that's made a big difference because he is ready for that. Absolutely. I don't think everybody's quite ready for that. 
Yeah. And well, well, that's what we lead the way. Yeah. Well, I, I see us as we're going this way. Now, it's good. We have to go out this way. But we're not getting deeper or we're not getting higher. What do you mean? Well, we're connecting with each other, and perhaps that's, that needs to take place in order for us to come up with some sort of a joint strategy, mm-hmm. in order for us to share the insights that we have from trying and either being successful or failing. That's a good sign. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I've been to lots of these feel-good meetings now, and what I don't see showing up in the chat, for instance, is people to say, well, that's a great idea, and it's inspired me to try to do this, or I'm going to build on that idea. And right now I'm publicly pledging that in my care community, in my college, in my organization, I'm going to take this message to them at the next meeting. I'm going to ask for donations. I'm going to propose that we become a dementia-friendly city. Mm -hmm. that's what we need to do, I think. (coughs) I think that is happening slowly, Richard. It's certainly happening, just happening in Australia. Yes. Um, And more and more people are speaking out, not just our carers, but people with dementia. And the media... Uh, you know, the media probably all over the world just wants a sad story and so they don't always focus on the things you want them to focus on. Um, They're about, you know, bums on seats, pardon the crude expression, or, you know, people buying papers or watching their channel. But the more we speak out as individuals with dementia, the more we must break down those myths and the stigma. And... You know, eventually we'll have to see change going up, not just across. And, and you know, Laura, I agree. Having this group now, it wasn't happening a year ago. And what uh, a wonderful forum for everybody to join into. So you've got students at this forum. And, you know, they'll take some of this back, hopefully, to, to their education institution. So... You know, little bit by little bit, um, uh, we will get there, hopefully in our lifetime, Richard. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, so a couple of comments. Uh, Rhonda says that she agrees with Richard's points. She's been to lots of committees, groups, etc., but not sure who is doing what. I, I think uh, Kate referred to just pushing paper around. <laughs> but yeah. it sounds like your committee is moving beyond. What are your plans to move beyond pushing paper? Oh, gosh, Laura. Um, you know, I think that uh, we're very, very new. We're evolving. We've got some amazing dreams. We're working on uh, dementia-friendly projects. We're looking at the Younger mm-hmm. Onset Dementia Key Worker Programme. There's a whole list of things, um, you know, setting up media protocols for the way people in the media um, interact with people with dementia and their families. So documents like that that we want to publish. Mm -hmm. Um, We're working on a talk to me document at the moment um, so Mm -hmm. that, you know, as we work on a dementia friendly community project, people with dementia, um, our group wanted to say, well, this is how we'd like to be talked to at the bank, at the post office, um, at the doctor's surgery, um, at the next conference, wherever, you know, we don't want to be patronised. We we don't want to have our diagnosis questioned all the time, those types of things. Um, we don't want people to become frustrated if, if we, you know, to, to be rude and angry to us if we're having trouble finding our words or working out the money when we purchase something in a retail shop. So... Um, you know, there's a lot of projects that we're uh, working on right now, but the goal is for it to go beyond just those types of things, um, but very early days. So I, I think that's as much as I can answer that, Laura. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, 
Okay, it's getting uh, close to uh, to our 90 minute <laughs> length of, of the webinar. Um, does anybody have any uh, any last questions or comments for Kate, or for Richard, or? I can't thank you enough for what you're doing for all of us, Kate, mm -hmm. and for what you're doing for the people in Australia, and what you're doing for me personally. Oh, um, thank you. You are a dementia angel, uh, and I thank you for fluttering above the clouds with it. Well, thank you very much. That's one of the greatest compliments I've ever had. Thank you. Yeah, and if I could just add, Kate, it is amazing what you've been able to accomplish, and it's really inspiring to see the difference one person has has made. You know, it yeah. really inspires me. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I just sowed the seed here um, and, you know, without the, the absolute goodwill and vision of our association, I couldn't have done it, but um, I definitely did keep trying to push that seed. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And good luck in your countries. Thank you. Mm. Um, Kate, we're, we're trying to um, mobilise to raise money to increase ADI's ability to bring people with dementia to the conference. They do provide a limited number of bursaries, as, as you know, um, yep. to help facilitate people attending that conference. Now, as somebody, you mentioned the ADI conference a couple of times. What impact did that have on you as a person with dementia to be able to attend that conference? Um, gosh, twofold, Laura. I was absolutely uh, inspired to be, you know, at long last meeting lots of other people with dementia who uh, were at a, an international conference. Um, I was furious, however, that there wasn't a keynote speaker, person with dementia, on each and every single day opening the conference. Yeah. Furious beyond, like it really fired me up. Um, and, and uh, you know, uh, it, it, yeah, it, almost beyond words actually. I, I was so upset about it. And, you know, we're shoved off into um, concurrent sessions and the only people almost that come and listen to people with dementia speak in those sessions other people with dementia and their families and friends. So actually the people who need to be listening to us are the so-called experts. You know, I, I consider that we're the experts in dementia. And like Richard was invited to be a keynote speaker in New Zealand at one of their um, national conferences, I believe, as was I last year. And every single researcher and professional person that spoke there just said, this is how every conference should be opened. This is the reason we're all working in this field. We say we want to help people with dementia. Why aren't we listening to them more? So to me in New Zealand, which was after ADI, it was an amazing change from ADI. Um, and the, the ADI conference was fantastic and I uh, hopefully get my abstracts in to uh, present in Puerto Rico. But, you know, that's going to cost us a fortune to get there. Yeah. I don't work anymore. My husband doesn't work full time because he spends some of his time, you know, running me around. And yet um, all of the professional speakers are funded to go. So I just find there's, there's so many anomalies in the associations that support us. Some of the things are sensational that they do. Um, and some of the things really do leave a bit to be desired still. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Um, so it's a learning curve for everybody. Um, and 30 years ago, there was no voice of people with dementia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Richard and Christine were right there at the very forefront of pioneering getting that voice out for people with dementia. But it's still a bit patronising, I feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to get funding. It, 
you know, I have no idea how to help an organisation to get funding to bring more people with dementia out. But from my perspective, just to have keynote speakers on every day, opening each day would be a huge, huge advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Will you come back in six months and give us an update on, on what you've done and what you've learned? I'd love to, Richard. Love okay. to. Let's do that in July. Fantastic. Okay. Actually, I think six months brings us to the ADI, ADI conference. Maybe we'll have to broadcast live from there or something. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah that, that's, uh, yeah, that's May. Yes, gosh. Yes. Yeah. I know. Ah, six months. Ah. In fact, I think we're, we're booked our tickets today as we speak. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we, we are John Sandbloom who's on here and, and Richard and I, we, in, we invite others to brainstorm with us to figure out which organizations we can approach. We're trying to take a proactive approach to getting people to the conference rather than waiting for ADI to figure out its budget. Yay. So that's, that's our goal. So anybody out there, if you're connected, you know, you're to <laughs> a millionaire, <laughs> let us know. <laughs> I think it's essential. <laughs> I think what attracts me to that conference is that for me, it was the first time I had seen a any number of people. Well, my first inspiration was um, MayRep. We have Lisa Lizelle here with us from MayRep with the uh, Changing Melodies Conference. And to see that possibility there, which was carried over into an ADI conference and, and mm. it, you know, it's um, to see the, the potential and we can do it. I know what we can do it. We can do it. Yeah. And, and every day we just have to get stronger and, uh, you know, more united as a global front. Yeah. That's yeah. how I feel. The, you know, the more united we are globally, the louder our voice is um, and, and we won't get squashed. We won't get squashed. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. thank you, Kate. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Okay, goodbye, everybody. We'll see you um, <laughs> next Tuesday, yeah. um, November 19th, is our monthly online memory cafe. And then Tuesday, December 10th is um, our monthly webinar, A Meeting of the Minds, and that month we are having Judy Berry as our guest. I'm very excited about having her on. Um, and then January, we are working on that, and I promise it's going to be great. Right, Richard? It's going to be kind of different. So we're not going to announce that yet, but it's going to be a bit different. More of a dialogue, I'll, I think. I'll get that a bit for it, Laura. Uh, oh, Kate, <laughs> it's a little early for you. <laughs> Maybe we have to try and shift the time every so often so you guys can be involved. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, I think so. Okay, Bye. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.